Hello, my name is Eric Kazarian. I am an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, sometimes known as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and one of the relatively few surgeons in the world that specializes in the surgical evaluation and treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy has been a main focus of my entire career, an area where other surgeons consider me an expert, and a common reason that patients come to see me from around the world. In a previous video, I described drug-induced sleep endoscopy and presented sample videos showing some of the findings that we can see during this evaluation. In this video, I discuss what we know about sleep endoscopy and how I use this information to improve the care of my patients with sleep apnea based on published research as well as my own experience. I hope you enjoy this video as well as my website where you can find more information about drug-induced sleep endoscopy and the surgical evaluation and treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. In the last video, I started with a basic question that I try to answer with every patient I see with obstructive sleep apnea or snoring. What is the best treatment for you, whether that means surgery, oral appliances, or a combination? The short answer is that no single treatment is best for everyone. Although I have lots of experience, because I perform more snoring and sleep apnea procedures than most surgeons, getting the best results for my patients depends on a few things. The ability to perform a wide range of procedures, the need to identify the factors that contribute to snoring or sleep apnea, and then the discussion with the patient to select the right treatment for them. The goal of patient evaluation is to identify the factors that contribute to snoring or sleep apnea. When I see patients in the office, the evaluation is done while patients are awake. This can be extremely helpful, but most patients with sleep apnea have blockage of breathing while they are asleep and not while they are awake. The challenge is that this awake evaluation may not be enough for some patients with sleep apnea. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy involves using a flexible fiber optic telescope to look inside the nose and throat while a patient is sedated in a careful way that is as close as possible to natural sleep. The goal is to have the patient have the same blockage of breathing that they have at night while they sleep so that I can see what is causing the blockage of breathing. The standard way to describe findings is what is called the VOTE classification, something that I developed with two European colleagues that incorporates the four main structures that contribute to blockage and breathing in the throat. The velum, or soft palate, oropharyngeal lateral walls, or sides of the throat, tongue, and epiglottis. For me, there are three questions that are important to sleep endoscopy and improving treatment selection. First, is it a good test? Meaning, does it have certain qualities that make it valid and reliable? Second, does sleep endoscopy change treatment? Third, and I think most important, are the findings associated with the results of treatment? For the first question, whether drug-induced sleep endoscopy is a good test, there are a couple of issues that need to be addressed. Putting a telescope in the nose and throat would be uncomfortable for most patients if they were trying to fall asleep naturally. For this reason, drug-induced sleep endoscopy involves going to the operating room and having patients receive sedation to make them more comfortable. It is important to know whether sleep endoscopy is valid, whether it reflects what happens during natural sleep. Beyond that, we want to know if sleep endoscopy is reliable, providing consistent findings. The first study I want to share comes from colleagues in Perth, Australia. On the right are the results of the nine different study participants that they examined carefully, with the dots and triangles representing different measurements that change when people go from awake to asleep. The study used a sedative medication called propofol, the same medication I use in drug-induced sleep endoscopy, and gradually increased the dosage to have someone go from consciousness just to the earliest stages of unconsciousness where they were breathing on their own but not awake enough to respond to someone calling their name. As you go to the right on each one of these individual graphs, you see that the dots and triangles start up high and then drop down lower. It turns out that these changes are pretty similar to what happens during natural sleep. I actually have led two studies of reliability. 
Test retest reliability checks whether results are similar if someone has drug-induced sleep endoscopy done more than once. We studied that and showed good agreement between findings of two different drug-induced sleep endoscopy evaluations performed about four months apart in 32 study participants. Inter-rater reliability evaluates whether two surgeons looking at the same drug-induced sleep endoscopy have similar judgments. We examined videos from over 100 study participants with sleep apnea and showed good inter-rater reliability. A final study in this area was led by a group in Antwerp, Belgium. The study compared the agreement among 50 surgeons relatively inexperienced with drug-induced sleep endoscopy and then five surgeons with substantial experience. The level of agreement was much higher for experienced surgeons, indicating the value of experience when it comes to drug-induced sleep endoscopy interpretation. The second question asked whether sleep endoscopy changes treatment. There are two parts to this question. One is whether a treatment plan developed after performing drug-induced sleep endoscopy is different from that developed after awake examination in the office. There are some studies that have tried to answer this, but honestly, it is extremely difficult to evaluate in a truly scientific way. The second part of the question is whether there are differences in drug-induced sleep endoscopy findings that you cannot really see in the office exam. Research, including my own, has shown that there are definite differences in some, but not all patients. My own experience is that there are some patients where drug-induced sleep endoscopy may be very important in developing a treatment plan, but in others, it may not be needed. This is why I do not perform drug-induced sleep endoscopy in every patient before surgery, but find it very helpful in certain situations. For me, the most important question about drug-induced sleep endoscopy is whether the findings are associated with the results of treatment with surgery or oral appliances. The key is that we want an evaluation that really tells us how to treat patients and improve results. I will talk briefly about what we know and think we know related to surgery and oral appliances. No single finding means that someone is a perfect or terrible candidate for surgery or oral appliances. At the same time, there do seem to be findings that make someone a better or worse candidate for certain treatments or more often, lead to changes in the selection of procedures or oral appliances. I will break down what we know about drug-induced sleep endoscopy and surgical outcomes into the various structures of our vote classification. We have just completed a major study of drug-induced sleep endoscopy and surgical outcomes, and I will include the findings that have been presented at national and international scientific conferences. For the velum, or soft palate, we know that patients with enlarged tonsils do better after soft palate surgery. Because soft palate surgery involves tonsillectomy, physically removing large tonsils creates more space for breathing, even though we still often remove tonsils that are not enlarged in order to perform the various types of soft palate surgery. Aside from tonsil size, it seems to be better if your soft palate is just falling backwards during sleep endoscopy what we call anteroposterior collapse because soft palate surgery generally involves moving the soft palate forward. If the soft palate is falling backwards with the sides of the throat also collapsing completely right behind the soft palate, this is called complete concentric collapse. We think that this finding may have poorer outcomes, but it actually is not entirely clear that this is true for most surgeries. Collapse of the sides of the throat called the oropharyngeal lateral walls, seems to be associated with poorer outcomes. There still can be substantial improvement in sleep apnea with surgery, but this may be one of the most important findings that we see in drug-induced sleep endoscopy because it can show patients who will not do well after the most common types of sleep apnea surgery and who should instead consider some procedures that have shown improvements in patients with this finding. These procedures include the newer soft palate surgery techniques like expansion, sphincter, pharyngoplasty, or lateral pharyngoplasty, as well as hypoglossal nerve stimulation. The tongue plays an important role in obstructive sleep apnea, and there are procedures available to treat the tongue, whether shrinking it, moving it forward, or removing part of it. Studies have shown that if a patient has their tongue falling back during drug-induced sleep endoscopy, ignoring that, 
For example, with surgery on the soft palate only leads to poorer outcomes. Studies have also shown that even if you do perform tongue surgery, the outcomes are poorer if the tongue is completely blocking the space for breathing instead of just partially blocking it. The one thing to note is that if the blockage is due to enlarged lingual tonsils, the tonsils on the back of the tongue, these can be removed during surgery, making the distinction between complete and partial blockage of breathing related to the tongue less of an issue. The epiglottis can be an important source of blockage in breathing, although it is less common, occurring in about 5% of all patients. Because it is less common, and also because it often happens with blockage related to other structures, it has been difficult to determine exactly how important obstruction related to the epiglottis is. One study did show poorer outcomes with complete blockage of breathing related to the epiglottis, but the evidence is not entirely clear. For oral appliances, one of the key maneuvers done during drug-induced sleep endoscopy is called the S-mark maneuver. It involves moving the lower jaw forward, similar to what an oral appliance offers. Some patients will have a dramatic opening of the space for breathing. Some will have no opening, and some will have opening in some areas, but not others. If someone has dramatic opening, I might recommend an oral appliance, even when a dentist providing the appliance is not as optimistic about it. If there is no opening, then maybe an oral appliance does not make as much sense. And then of course, we can combine an oral appliance in surgery, often using the appliance to open the area behind the tongue and using surgery to treat the soft palate. There is some very limited evidence suggesting that these findings of jaw advancement during drug-induced sleep endoscopy may be associated with outcomes from oral appliances, but the ideal study has not been done. I hope you've enjoyed learning about drug-induced sleep endoscopy, its benefits, and its limitations. I find drug-induced sleep endoscopy and the entire field of sleep surgery fascinating. I'm committed to educating patients and colleagues, as well as advancing the field of sleep surgery through research. This has allowed us to offer world-class treatment for snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Please do not hesitate to contact us with any questions or if you'd like to schedule an appointment.